So let's continue our series on miracles. How many of you guys have enjoyed this so far? Did you all get anything out of last week? Because it was, it was fire. <laughs> it was so good. And today's going to be good stuff too. Um, you see, we're on the starting line of an incredible move of God. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to watch my language here because sometimes we say like this move is coming, but it's actually already here. Like we're just, we're just at the starting line. Like we're, we're getting this going. It's, it's getting moving. Um, we're a church that's positioned and ready for God to use for the revival that's already taking place. And that's awesome. And we've already witnessed this going on because the gifts of the spirit have been at work like every Sunday here. And this is just going to ramp up and ramp up and ramp up until we see these incredible miracles of God right here in our church. So excited for that. Um, But each week during this series, I've been sharing a true story from the Azusa Street Revival to stir up your faith. Has it been stirring you up? This incredible revival started in 1906 in Los Angeles, California. And the cool thing is amazing miracles were released every single day for three and a half years. So that might be what we're coming up on, right? Like, it's not just going to happen on one Sunday, but it's just going to keep going and keep going and keep going, just like it did then. But missing limbs grew out where there were none. Eyeballs filled in empty sockets. Cancerous growth just fell off onto the floor. I mean, lives were restored day after day as they just bathed in the glory of God. And they called it the Shekinah glory back then. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. But what that means is that the glory of God was actually tangible in the room. Like, you could see it, you could feel it. And they said it was just kind of like this, uh, this fog in the room and and it was almost like breathing in heaven. I mean, how cool is that? But healing miracles were accomplished not just through the ministers in the room, but also through the kids in the room. So a boy named Ralph was 12 years old at the time when an old woman showed up in a wheelchair. She had some disease that had paralyzed her from the waist down, and Ralph got excited because he knew that she was going to be healed. So he went up to her, and she got a little testy, Because he went up to her and he was getting her legs off of the little things on the wheelchair and trying to fold up the flaps because they had a rule at Azusa Street. The flaps had to go up before they prayed because you were going to be healed whenever they prayed. So young Ralph told the old lady, you're going to jump out of your wheelchair and you're going to run. And the woman protested in disbelief. And he said, now listen to me. You have to stop griping and nagging and going on. We're going to pray for you and you're going to be healed. Don't argue with us. This is Azusa Street. You see the glory here? You're going to be healed. How awesome is that? A 12-year-old boy talking like that. She didn't say anything after that. She just kind of sat there and stared at him. So he prayed for her. And he actually had to pray twice, and he was praying really hard. And finally, he reached and laid his hands on her backbone and her hip, and the bones began to pop. And little Ralph said, take off running. And she just looked at him. I said, take off running. And she jumped up and she took off running. And then Ralph took off running after her and he couldn't even catch her. A 12-year-old boy could not catch the grandma who was just in a wheelchair. That is incredible. That is awesome. So don't discount what your kiddos can do. Get them involved in this. They don't have to wait till they're an adult. Help them learn how to pursue God and let God use them and let the gifts of the Spirit operate in their lives because they're just as uh, able as we are. Maybe even more because they don't have all that stuff to work through. But I share these stories with you because in 1910, after that revival was over, it was prophesied that in about 100 years, there'd be another revival like Azusa Street. Only this time, it would not be in one place, but it would be all over the world. And this revival would not be with just one person or just pastors. It will be with everybody in the body of Christ, and the revival will not end until the Lord returns. Who wants to be part of those amazing miracles of God? Yes. Well, let's continue to prepare for these miracles by renewing our minds with the Word of God. Let's just make sure that we don't have anything getting in the way. Because you know the only thing that can stop these miracles is us and our stinking thinking. So let's start by taking another look at our core scripture for this series. Ethan has to follow along with me today because we're having all kinds of technical difficulties going on here. And that's okay because we can improvise. So Ethan, we're at Mark 11, verse 22. And Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. You know, Jesus said to the disciples, but I want you to know, Jesus is saying this to you this morning. Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it'll happen. But you must really believe it'll happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it'll be yours. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone that you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. So in this short lesson from Jesus, we learn four things about receiving miracles from God. Number one, you got to have faith in God. Number two, you got to speak your faith. Number three, you got to remove the doubt. 
And number four, you got to forgive others. And today we're going to dive into removing doubt. And this is most likely the thing that's been tripping most of y'all up when it comes to receiving from God. We've got some nods in the front row being honest this morning. That's good stuff. If you've been trying to walk in faith, but you're not seeing the results of it, this is the message you need. Today is your day. Somebody say, today is my day. All right. You're going to find out what's getting in the way of your faith so you can remove it and get rid of it. So have you ever prayed for something and it seemed as if God didn't even hear you? Have you ever prayed for somebody to be healed and then they died? This kind of stuff leaves us confused, and often these negative experiences cause us to abandon our faith, and we start to think, well, if it didn't work that time, then it's never going to work. Now you know. You're not alone in thinking that way. Anybody in the room never had those thoughts? All right. We got one in the back. Paul, come up here and take over this message. (laughs) And really, you know, we start this journey of faith at a disadvantage here in America, because we live in a culture of immediate gratification, and we think that God should just be as obsessed with, with immediate as we are. We want God to answer our prayer now. I mean, if Google can answer my question now, then surely God can answer my prayer now. You know this is true. We all think this way. And then I bring it out into the open. You're like, wow, that's pretty foolish. You see, we all want to hear that God answers prayers immediately every time, but... It's just not true, so I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you today. Instead, let me show you a story in the Bible that helps you understand that the answer is always coming. Sometimes it just takes time. This is found in the book of Daniel. He lived in a culture that was anti-God, yet he faithfully lived his life for God. (laughs) Kind of like where we are today. In Daniel chapter 9, he was praying. The people of God were in a mess because, well, even when God gave them a chance to change their behaviors... They didn't. (laughs) Sounds familiar. Daniel was praying and he was repenting on behalf of Israel. He was confessing their sins and asking them to forgive them, even though they didn't deserve it. Maybe you had some of those prayers the past two years for America. He was also looking for clarity on a vision that he had, asking God to help him understand this vision. And if you read Daniel's prayer, it seemed as if he prayed for about three minutes. So that should be encouraging to all of our short prayers in the room, (laughs) right? Amen. And at this point, look at what happened. This is found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me and explained, Daniel, I've come here to give you insight and understanding. Cool. Daniel's prayer was answered in about three minutes, right? That's awesome. It wasn't immediate, but I think we could all handle a three-minute delay. I mean, that's about how long it takes to get through the Chick-fil-A drive through Or we could at least check Facebook while we're waiting on God to answer our prayer, Right? But Daniel's prayer actually wasn't answered in three minutes. It was answered immediately. And we find that out in the next verse. Take a look. The moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I'm here to tell you what it was, for you're very precious to God. So when did God answer? The moment he began praying, right? Immediately. Then why did it take the angel three minutes to get this answer to Daniel? I don't know. Like maybe Gabriel was traveling from the other side of the galaxy and it just... Some travel time, right? I, I don't know, but what we do know is that God answered Daniel's prayer the moment he began praying. God set the answer in motion, but something had to happen in the spiritual realm before it was made manifest in the physical realm. And about now, you might be thinking, okay, I can wait three minutes. Awesome. So from now on, I'm going to put a three-minute deadline on God. But before you make a three-minute doctrine on this one scripture, let me show you what happened in the very next chapter of the book of Daniel. I mean, this was years later in Daniel's life. So now he's more mature in his faith. He's been getting closer to God. And therefore, I bet his prayer is going to be answered faster this time. Take a look at what happened. Daniel chapter 10, verse 2. When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time I'd eat no rich food, no meat or wine, cross my lips. Oh, man, three weeks. It wasn't even a pleasant three weeks. It's not like he was in Hawaii for three weeks. He was mourning and fasting while seeking God for an answer for three whole weeks. You guys know that's a long time to wait for an answer. Three weeks? How could somebody as awesome as Daniel have to wait three weeks for God to answer his prayer. 
Well, at the end of this three-week period, once again, a messenger from heaven came to explain the vision to Daniel. And this time, the messenger even explained why it took three weeks. Take a look at this. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. When did God hear his prayer? When he began to pray. Once again, as soon as Daniel prayed, God set the answer in motion. But something had to take place in the spiritual realm before it was made manifest in the physical realm. Last time it took about three minutes. This time it took three weeks. And the cool thing is the messenger of heaven gives us an explanation. You keep reading, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. Oh, there was a fight going on in the spiritual realm that delayed the answer from getting to Daniel. This is intriguing, isn't it? And I mean, it's why we need to be aware that there is a spiritual realm. You can ignore it all you want to, but that doesn't make it go away. It's there. Even though we can't see it, it's actually more real than our physical realm because the physical realm was created by the spiritual realm. In this story, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if Daniel gave up on his prayer. What would have happened? What if Daniel gave up a few days in? I mean, most of us would. We'd be like, God, you answered this kind of prayer in three minutes last time. It's been three days. I guess I'm just going to have to handle this one myself. Yeah, you do it. I know you do. And if Daniel would have done that, he may not have ever gotten his answer. I mean, why would the angel continue fighting that spiritual fight if Daniel had abandoned his faith? Hmm. I think we're all starting to understand why so many prayers go unanswered. God has always answered immediately. He always has. But we tend to give up before the answer has time to be made manifest in our physical world. We've taken on this mentality that if I don't see it immediately... God didn't hear me, but that's just a lie that the enemy uses to get you out of faith. But now you know better. Doesn't matter how long it takes. God heard me the first time. In both of these stories about Daniel, I want you to remember that God answered him as soon as he began praying, as soon as he began praying. But there was a period of time that had to pass before it was made manifest in the physical realm. Can we develop some patience in the room today? That's why we're getting rid of doubt today. Because your doubt is that thing that keeps blocking God's answer from getting to you. God's always answered your prayer. He always has, every time. But you have a tendency to build this wall of doubt that keeps your answer from ever getting to you. This isn't God's fault. It's yours. But you can fix it by getting rid of doubt. Get rid of it. To help you get a better understanding of doubt so that you can recognize it and eliminate it, I'm going to break it down into three different categories. And the first one is ignorance. If you want to be politically correct, lack of knowledge. Does that, maybe that makes you feel a little better. Sometimes you just don't know. You just don't know. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and there's just some things you haven't heard yet. So you doubt God simply because you don't know something about God. For example, you may have grown up in poverty. That's all you know. You don't have no idea that God wants you to have more than enough. So you just assume that God wants you to be poor. The way out of this kind of doubt is simple. Take time to hear the word of God. I recommend you make it a point to hear God's word every day, multiple times a day. Maybe instead of watching your favorite sitcom at night, spend that time hearing the word of God. And the second one is wrong teaching. And it's basically the same, but this one's harder to overcome. It's kind of like if I was teaching using a blackboard up here, and if it was blank, all I'd have to do is start writing the truth on the blackboard. But if it was full of wrong teaching, we'd first have to take time to clear off the blackboard and get it all clean. Like if you've been taught that God made you sick or that this is punishment for your sin or that God somehow gets glory out of you being sick or poor, then the antidote's the same. You need to hear the word of God and hear it and hear it and hear it. You're just going to have to hear it a whole lot more. This one's harder to overcome than ignorance because you got to hear the word of God frequently enough to erase the wrong teaching and fill your mind with the truth. I'm not trying to discourage you guys this morning, but this one takes a while. It takes a while. You might have to hear the truth several times a day for a year before it erases that wrong teaching from your mind. 
When you uncover wrong teaching in your life, you just have to be diligent to get rid of it. If you've been taught that God wants you poor, look up every scripture you can find about God's provision. There's a lot of them. Listen to every message you can find on YouTube about God's provision. Keep filling your mind with the truth until you get it. So these first two types of doubt, ignorance and wrong teaching, are both overcome by hearing the word of God. And the third one is circumstantial doubt. If you pray for somebody to be healed and they end up dying, that circumstance is going to make you think, this doesn't work. If you've been sick for years, your circumstance is going to make you think, God does not want to heal me. So how do you overcome this kind of doubt? This is found in one of the healing miracles of Jesus. We actually talked about this miracle last week, too, but we're going to get something new out of it this week. That's the beauty of the Word of God. There are so many layers of meaning to uncover. So this is found in Matthew chapter 17. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. So here we have a father who desperately wants his son to be healed, His son was having terrible seizures on a regular basis that threatened his life. Can you imagine how stressful that would have been as as the parent? That'd have been hard. And the Gospel of Mark shares this same story in chapter 9, but gives us a few more details. And what we find out is this isn't something that had just started happening. This is something that had been going on for a long time. So the father brought the boy to the disciples. They prayed, and nothing happened. Like we talked about last week, their speaking sounded like faith. But there was some doubt getting in the way. And here's how Jesus feels about that. Jesus says, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Our inability to use the power of God is not cute to God. It's not cute. Sometimes we get ourselves caught in this sense false... This is false sense of humility, saying things like, I'm just, I'm just human, like there's only so much that I can do. We convince ourselves that this sorry attitude somehow honors God. It offends him. It offends God. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you, and that's what you do with it? Come on. God wants us to be confident. He wants us to heal the sick and cast out demons. Obviously, it's not because we're awesome. It's because the power of God is working through us. So let it work. Let it work. So the disciples failed, like we often do, and Jesus came and cleaned up their mess. Woo, thank God for Jesus. And here's what happened next. The disciples came to Jesus privately because they weren't going to ask this in public. They were a little embarrassed, I'm sure. Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. In other words, you couldn't do it because of your doubt. Some translations say, because of your little faith. And even my favorite translation, the NLT, says, because you don't have enough faith. But sometimes our modern translations get it wrong. That's why you should always check things against the translation that's closest to the original language, which is the King James Version or the New King James Version. Because we know this whole little faith thing that the NIV has and the NLT has is not accurate because of the continuation of this verse. Look at what it says next. If you have faith as a mustard seed, which is really small, by the way, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. If Jesus was blaming the disciples' inability to cast out a demon on their little faith, why would he go on to say, all you need is a little faith to to move this mountain? That doesn't even make sense. Because Jesus wasn't talking about little faith. He was talking about doubt and unbelief. The reason the disciples couldn't cast the demon out is because of their own doubt. The faith was there, but doubt was getting in the way. We shouldn't be asking for more faith, y'all. We should be asking God to help us get rid of the doubt. It seems that the disciples were dealing with circumstantial doubt because they watched that boy having a wild seizure right in front of them, and this circumstance caused them to doubt something Caused them to doubt that they could even handle this one. They had already been casting out demons, y'all. It's not like this is their first time. They had been casting out demons. But this time must have been scarier because, for whatever reason, doubt creeped in and they weren't able to do it this time. So they asked Jesus why, and he gave him this answer. In Matthew 17, it says, this kind, of, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. You see, most people read this story and they think, well, Jesus must have been saying this kind of demon 
only goes out by prayer and fasting. Have you ever read it that way? That's how I've read it in the past too. But he wasn't talking about the demon here. He was talking about their doubt. This kind of doubt does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Y'all are getting excited, aren't you? I mean, everybody loves a good fast. All right, let's talk about fasting. But let me tell you why it works this way. Prayer moves you closer to God. The more time you spend in prayer, the more aware you are of his presence. If you don't spend time with God in prayer, you'll remain closer to your circumstances than you are to God. And then fasting partners up with prayer, it takes, it to, takes it to the next level. When you fast, it makes you aware of how much your physical body is in control. So you can put it in its rightful place. If you want to make your body upset, you should fast. Hunger is one of the strongest desires and probably the easiest one to aggravate. Some of y'all can't go more than four hours without eating. Your body tells you what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat, and you just bow down and say, oh, great body of mine, have whatever you want to. Mm. So when you fast, your body's crying out, feed me. I'm in control here. And your spirit says, nope, I'm going to believe the word of God over this pain that I feel. And your body shouts back, who do you think you are to deny me? It's been 20 years since you've told me that I can't eat. (laughs) But you fast anyway because you know the word of God says man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And your body responds, I'll be dead by noon. I know it. (laughs) I'm just going to be dead. Won't survive. And so you decide, all right, we're going to go two days instead of one. And your body says, no, you can't. I'll be dead for sure. And you say, all right, three days. And about this time, your body realizes it better shut up. That's why those hunger pains just kind of go away after a while. It gives up. Your body's wimpy. It really is. It'll put up a fight for a little while, and then it just gives up. But that's what fasting is all about. It helps you remember that your body does not get the last word. God does. God does. So when that symptom shows up again, you laugh because God's word prevails over that sickness. Or when you pray for someone and they get worse, you laugh because it doesn't matter what it looks like. God's word works every time, as long as we don't negate our faith through doubt and unbelief. So circumstantial doubt only comes out through prayer and fasting. You have to draw yourself closer to God. and You have to show your body who's boss. Are you realizing how God has never been withholding miracles? He never has. It's always been us getting in the way of our own faith. But we know how to overcome doubt. Now you do, so get to it. Overcome it. Take every opportunity to hear the word of God. And when you have doubt creep in because of your circumstances, hit your prayer closet and treat your body to a good old fast. Mm. Since the word of God is what removes doubt, let's end today by overcoming some of the most common doubts with the word of God. And for each of these, I'm going to share the truth, and then I'm going to give you three scriptures to back it up. If you're dealing with one of these, write down these scripture references so you can begin to read them out loud to yourself every day until you get over this doubt. So the first common doubt, if I'm sick, it must be God's will. But the truth is, God wants me well. I'll prove it to you in scripture. John chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. Did Jesus ever make somebody sick to teach them something? Did Jesus ever refuse to heal somebody? Did Jesus go about spreading disease and discouragement? No. No. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. Do you know what that tells us? God wants you well. He wants you well. If you're sick, it's not God's doing. He wants to heal you. So cooperate with his will. Next scripture, 1 Peter 2.24. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. Man, I love that. There's so much going on right now that says you can't be free from sin, and I call that BS. That's so much crap. I'm tired of the body of Christ being just weighed down by sin as if we're powerless over sin. You are not powerless over sin. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. Surely it can overcome sin. It can. You are dead to sin, and you can live for what is right. Sorry, that was a sidetrack. By his wounds, you are healed. 
Jesus took care of your sickness through his death. He did. You deserved the sickness because of sin. You deserved it. But Jesus took your place so that you could be forgiven. He took your sickness so that you could be healed. The divine exchange, it's already taken place. You're not waiting on anything. It's already done. Last scripture, 3 John verse, chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. John was writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This isn't John's idea. This is the Holy Spirit's idea. God desires for you to prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So that's just three of many scriptures that prove God wants you well. You can, pro- you can find hundreds more. Now, you can find your three scriptures that you pull out of context that make you think that God wants you sick. Or you can believe the hundreds of scriptures that prove that God wants you well. You make the choice. So if you're fighting doubt because someone taught you that God allows sickness in your life or that he only heals sometimes but not every time, you need to dig into these scriptures until the doubt's gone. All right, the next one, common doubt here. Satan is more powerful than me. Truth, Satan can't do anything without my cooperation. I'll prove it to you in scripture. James chapter 4, verse 7. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Does it say he might? Nope, it says he will. As long as you take the initiative, submit yourself to God, and resist the devil. The only reason Satan can stick around and torment you is because you're allowing it to happen. It's time to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Next scripture, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk them on snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Did Jesus give you partial authority? No, he gave you all authority over the power of the enemy. Satan's power is worthless unless you refuse to walk in your God-given authority. Mm. One more, Psalm 91, verse 7. Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Even if everybody around you is allowing Satan to steal, kill, and destroy, you can be living in your Holy Spirit bubble. Come on. Completely untouched by the power of the enemy. It's your choice. You can do it. I know this is true because of my own experience through COVID. Everybody was afraid. I wasn't because I chose to submit to God and resist the devil. And he fleed, and I got to live in peace. (laughs) I tried to bring some people with me. Come on, peace over here, peace over here. That fear is not helping you. All right, here's the last common doubt. God is glorified when I live sick or poor. The truth is, God is glorified when I make a difference. I'll prove it to you in Scripture. John chapter 15, verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Are you bearing fruit whenever you're sick? No, you're tired and grumpy. Or how about whenever you're poor? No, because you're unhappy and jealous of everybody else around you. God gets no glory out of you being sick. He gets no glory out of you being poor. He's glorified when you're well, when you're prospering, and when you're bearing much fruit. Amen. Next scripture, 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. God is not withholding his promises. His answer is always yes. And it glorifies him when you choose to live in his promises. And that includes health and wealth and protection. And the list goes on. Do you know what God has promised you? Because if you don't, you should go search it out. Because his promises are for you. If you're struggling to prosper financially, then I recommend going to listen to Jesse Duplantis until you do. Until you prosper. And if you're struggling with healing, go and listen to Andrew Womack until you're healed. God has given us teachers and preachers to help us understand these things. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And he anoints certain people for certain subjects. And you got to find out who those are and go listen to them and help you overcome those areas you're struggling. You know, there's no excuse for not hearing the word of God every day. There's not one. It's easier than ever with YouTube, the preachers on YouTube, the Bible app, your pastor bringing you a powerful word every Sunday, and then posting it online so that you can listen to it again and again and again and again if you need to, right? You're just going to have to make a choice to hear the word of God rather than hearing what the world is saying on Facebook and Disney Plus and whatever else the world is trying to use to get to you. You get to choose. Are you going to hear the world or are you going to hear God? All right, Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Is sickness a light that shines? (laughs) No, 
How about poverty? If we want to glorify our Father in heaven, then we must show the world what it's like in heaven, on earth, as it is in heaven. There's no sickness. There's no poverty. There's no lack on earth as it is in heaven. Y'all, we don't have to wait until the sweet by and by to live in these promises. We can live in them right now, and we need to live in them right now because that's how we show the world how good our God is. So God is not withholding miracles. And we've eliminated that pesky doubt today through the word of God.